What is up everybody? So in the last video, we took a look at five very important square matrices in data science. We looked at, well, square matrices themselves. We looked at symmetric matrices, triangular matrices, diagonal matrices, and the identity matrix. And the truth is those come up all the time and they're really, really useful and pretty intuitive to understand once we get a hang of things. But in the interest of keeping that video kind of contained, there is one very important square matrix in data science that I left out, which we need to talk about as well when it comes to all the important matrices in data science. And that is the orthogonal matrix. Now I left that out of the previous video because it does take a little bit more thinking and it does take a little bit more digging in to see why this definition actually comes up in data science at all instead of just being kind of a cool fact. And that's what we'll explore in this video. So we're gonna start with the definition here and then we'll work our way through what this definition entails, what its consequences are, and then eventually work through what an actual application of this would be in principal component analysis, which we often use to reduce the dimensionality of some kind of data set, to reduce the feature space. So first the definition, a square matrix, so again, this is a subset of square matrices, a square matrix whose columns or rows, I will say, it applies to both the rows and the columns, but we'll just stick to the columns here for simplicity. It's a square matrix whose columns are linearly independent unit vectors. Now, there's not that many words here, but they are kind of big enough and technical enough for us to need to unpack what is going on here. So you often see the letter Q used for orthogonal matrices. So we're gonna say we have some matrix Q whose columns are Q1, Q2, all the way to Qn. And again, this is an n by n matrix, so the number of rows is n, and as we see, the number of columns is also n. What we're gonna do now is do the inner product, the dot product, of each of these n vectors, each of these n column vectors, with each of the other n column vectors. So that's gonna be given as qi transpose qj. So this is an inner product, inner product, or a dot product. Now this, according to our definition, is equal to some value if we're talking about an inner product or a dot product of a vector with itself, in other words, i equals j, and it's equal to some other value if we're talking about the inner product or dot product of a vector with some other vector, in other words, i is not equal to j. What does it mean for two columns to be linearly independent or two vectors to be linearly independent? It means their dot product is going to be equal to zero. And so if we're talking about two distinct column vectors in this set here, then we're saying, according to this definition, then the dot product is gonna be equal to zero. Now the other important word here is that these are all unit vectors, which means their norm or their length is going to be equal to one. And the norm of a vector is given by the square root of its inner product with itself. So in this case, where we are talking about a vector in itself, this would need to be equal to exactly one. So this mathematical definition is exactly identical to this verbal definition up here. Now we haven't talked a single bit about why this even matters, but hopefully now we can at least match up the verbal to the mathematical. And now, given this seemingly weird definition that came out of nowhere, we can start talking about consequences of this definition and then the applications and the usefulness of this kind of flows from there. So one thing we can do here, for no apparent reason, is take the transpose of this matrix Q and multiply it by the original matrix Q. If we do that in expanded form, then all of these columns become rows. And so we get Q1 transpose all the way down to Qn transpose. So this is the Q transpose matrix. And then we have the original Q matrix written over here. Now, as we do with matrix multiplication, you take the first row here and you take the dot product or inner product with each of the columns here. And that makes up your first row. Let's talk about what that first row is gonna look like. When we take the inner product of the first row here with the first column here, well, those are actually the same exact vector. So according to our mathematical or verbal definition, that's gonna be exactly equal to one. Now, if we take the inner product of this first row here with any other column in here, which is not equal to that first row, then that's exactly gonna be equal to zero, again, according to our definition. So the first row of our matrix product is going to be one followed by all zeros. And the pattern is the exact same for every other row you look at. It's just that the one is going to be shifted according to whatever position we're talking about. What that means is that the diagonal of the resulting matrix multiplication is all ones and everything off the diagonal is equal to zero. As we learned in the previous video, 
That is exactly what is called the identity matrix of size n. We also learned in the previous video that if some matrix times some other matrix is equal to the identity matrix of size n, then those two matrices, in this case q transpose and q, in some sense undo each other. Whatever operation q did on some vector to its right, q transpose is going to inverse, is going to reverse that, so that eventually we just get no transformation at all. So we have this really cool consequence, if we know some matrix is orthogonal, that the matrix inverse is equal to just the transpose of the matrix. And the reason that's helpful is because in general calculating a matrix inverse is not an easy operation. Its time complexity is rather complex, it's not something that we would like to do if we can avoid it. And in this case we can avoid it because if you ask me for the inverse of an orthogonal matrix, I can simply and immediately just tell you that it's equal to the transpose of that matrix. And transposes are a lot cheaper to compute than inverses because if you think about how would I get the transpose of a matrix, well, I just have to visit every element in that matrix once and populate some transposed matrix, which is that matrix flipped along its diagonal. So the inverse is very cheap to compute if we know that the matrix is orthogonal, and that's our first dip in the water towards usefulness towards data science. But that's not all. We have two more things to talk about for why orthogonal matrices are so important in data science. And the next one comes to us from talking about how a matrix is some kind of machine or function or operator that applies on a vector. So assume you have some input vector u that you're going to use the matrix q on. So the output is simply given by q u. Now, what can we say? Is there some relationship between the input and the output in terms of lengths or norms or magnitudes? Well, let's just see. What would the norm or magnitude or length of the output vector b, it's going to be given by the output vector transpose times the output vector and the square root of all that. In other words, it's just going to be the inner product of the output vector with itself, and we take the square root and that gives us the L2 norm or the length of this output vector. So that's simply given by square root QU transpose QU. We know we can take this transpose and apply it to both of the things inside this multiplication and then reverse them. So this is equal to U transpose Q transpose QU. Seems like this is just complicated until we revisit our previous page and remember that we already have the consequence that Q transpose Q is equal to the identity matrix. So this Q transpose Q right here just goes away. So we're left with just U transpose U, the square root of that. But what is that? That is just the input's length or magnitude or norm. So what we found is that if our transformation Q is orthogonal, then it's going to preserve the length. It's going to make sure that the magnitude or norm or length of whatever is put in is exactly the magnitude or norm or length of whatever is coming out. It doesn't change that at all. And we can actually go one step further, even though I won't prove it here, the proof looks pretty much identical to this. Not only are we preserving the lengths of the inputs, we're also preserving the angles between two inputs. So for example, if I put in one input u and I put in a different input v, I'll just draw a little picture for us. So if this is u and I put in some other input v, then there's some angle theta between these guys. If I now look at the angle between qu, qu, and I look at the angle between that and qv, then the angle between these two is going to be identical. It preserves the angle between your inputs, so it's the same as the angle between the respective outputs, so it's angle preserving. And some examples of these, because this seems very theoretical, like what kind of transformations even do this? There's some very basic transformations that actually do this. For example, rotations and reflections. Rotations, we can just draw a picture here again. If you think about a rotation, here's some U and here's some V. And let's say we have some matrix Q, an orthogonal matrix Q, which is gonna rotate each of these by 90 degrees. Let me just use a different color here. If we look at the changed vector for u, so just rotated by 90 degrees, then this is going to be our qu. If we look at v rotated by 90 degrees, then this is going to be our qv. And we see both of these properties, the length preserving, because when you rotate something, you don't change its length, you're just rotating it. So that's preserved, check. And the angle preserving also makes sense, because when you rotate two vectors by the same degree, then the angle between them is not going to change. So there's some very elementary transformations like rotations and reflections also have this property that fit these two bills. 
And that's another big application towards data science, which is there's a lot of very intuitive transformations we can do on vectors, which by nature are orthogonal. And so we do need to care about the fact that those matrices are orthogonal matrices. And lastly, we'll look at one big hot application of orthogonal matrices, which is in principal component analysis. We have a whole set of videos on principal component analysis. I'll of course link them in the description below if you're interested in all of the math and all of the theory that goes into it. But in a nutshell, principal component analysis is used when our data set has a lot of features and we'd like to bring the dimensionality of that feature space down without losing any information or rather losing as little information as we can. And so here's a quick picture here where we have just two dimensions or two features and our blue points here are all of the data points. And we would like to be able to explain this data in the dimensions with maximum variance. And so we see the first dimension of maximum variance is going to be this green arrow here. So this, this arrow here because that's kind of, in very loose terms, the direction that the data goes in the most. And then when it comes to the next principal component, so this is the first principal component, when it comes to the second principal component, it's going to be orthogonal or linearly independent of the first principal component, because we've already explained all the variation in this direction, so we want to pick an orthogonal direction to explain the remainder, or as much of the remaining variance there is, and so this would be our second principal component. And so based on this picture, and we can extend this to higher dimensions, it's just I can't draw those on this 2D sheet of paper. But the principal components are the orthogonal eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. Now this fact seemingly came out of nowhere, and in our previous videos we did prove why this is true, but let's unpack it just a little bit. We've already shown why the principal components would need to be orthogonal, so that's been explained. And also, there we can just take this as fact for now, but the principal components you can get those orthogonal vectors as the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix of the data. So let's talk about the covariance matrix of the data. The covariance matrix of the data is a square matrix who tells you how much of a relationship is there between each feature in your data and every other feature in your data. So if there's three features in your data set, then the covariance matrix is going to be this three by three matrix each element of which tells you how much of a relationship there is between this feature and that feature. Now said like that, this matrix needs to be symmetric because the relationship between feature one and feature three is the same as the relationship between feature three and feature one. I've just said them in the reverse order. So because the covariance matrix is symmetric, there is again a fact which we can take for granted right now in linear algebra that says that the eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix such as the covariance matrix, are going to be orthogonal. And so the whole story here is that we have some symmetric matrix called the covariance matrix. We can show that we would need to get its eigenvectors to get these principal components. And the eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix like this one are going to be orthogonal. So if I collect all of those eigenvectors or all of those principal components into one matrix, often called W, then we get W1, which is the first principal component, W2, the second principal component, W3, so on and so on and so on, to Wn, which would be the final principal component. And what do we know about W? Well, we know that each of these are linearly independent of each other, and we can also enforce that each of these has a norm of one by simply just dividing by whatever its current norm would be, which lands us exactly squarely back in the definition of an orthogonal matrix. So when we're talking about principal component analysis, this very popular dimensionality reduction technique, we can't talk about it without also talking about the orthogonal matrix that sits at its core. And this is far from the only application of orthogonal matrices. There's other ones we've talked about on this channel, like singular value decomposition, eigen decomposition, all these things, where orthogonal matrices are intimately and squarely at the heart of these techniques, which are very important in data science. So hopefully we've shown in this video what orthogonal matrices are, the definition of them, some consequences that come from them that make our lives a lot easier in data science, some examples of orthogonal matrices and properties they have as well, and also just a big application of orthogonal matrices in the form of principal component analysis and beyond. So thank you so much for watching this video. We'll definitely do more videos on important matrices in data science. Like and subscribe for more videos just like this, and I will see everybody next time.